Romans chapter number 8, we begin our reading in verse number 14. The Bible says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Let's pray. Father, we certainly thank you, Lord, that you're on the throne. We thank you, Father, that you're in control. And Lord, we thank you that you answer prayer. Lord, long before we had the first congregational song, we had prayer time, and Lord, I asked that, Lord, you'd give us an unusual service. And Lord, from the onset, it's been unusual. It's been different. And so, Lord, we want to thank you. Lord, we never want to get in a routine. We never want to get stuck in a rut. We never want to be complacent. And Lord, you've used testimonies about relationship and about how you've fed your people and about your goodness and your provisions. And Lord, folks just thanking you for the truth, for our church, for you meeting needs. Lord, we've heard songs sung. Lord, it's been a blessing. Folks standing in the pew and singing, and folks standing and singing. Lord, it's just been a blessing. Lord, folks have confessed sin in their life and in their heart. Ask the church to forgive them, and the church has openly acknowledged forgiveness and loved on people. Lord, it's been good to be here. Lord, we certainly appreciate all that you've blessed us with thus far. Now, Lord, I truly don't know what you're going to do next. Lord, that's not for me to know. Lord, I just yield myself to you. Lord, ask that you would pour out of me the very thoughts that you would like to convey to your people tonight. Help us to glean, to grow in the grace and admonition and knowledge of our Lord. Help us to become more spiritual. Enhance our relationship with Christ. Help us to ever appreciate not only your holiness, but help us to appreciate the adoption of sonship. God, help us to walk not only in newness of life, but walk worthy of your namesake. Now, God, bless these thy people. Be with those that are working with the children and the teens on the other side of the building. And God, glorify your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice a few things from Romans chapter number 8. Some things that ought to be an encouragement to we God's people. I'm glad that this great chapter, God inspired the Apostle Paul to pin down. The first thing I would like you to notice is I'd like you to notice forgiveness. Boy, you ought to never underestimate the power of forgiveness. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, There is therefore now condemnation. Is that what it says? No. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Uh, my dear friends, I'm glad uh, that if you've repented of sin... Uh, if it's been washed in the blood, if God has forgiven you of it, there is now no more condemnation. God no longer holds you accountable for it. Brother Philip, you testified that when you was lost, you didn't even know you was lost, but you went to church and God showed up 
and he convicted you of sin and you didn't even know what he was convicted you of but you felt guilty uh, and you hit the altar uh, and you was weeping uh, and you cried out to God uh, and God forgave you uh, and he changed your life. Uh, hey, what a blessing to know uh, that when he forgives you, he no longer holds it against you. Uh, there's no more condemnation. Uh, there is no more sin in my past. Uh, I have no more past. Uh, I just have uh, from here forward with God. Uh, what a blessing to have forgiveness tonight. Uh, now understand, it says there's now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus saved who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Can I say, there is forgiveness when there's a change of heart against sin. When there's true repentance. Can I say, there's a lot of people that have the mentality, and preachers have the one that created the monster, that say, well, all I got to do is tell God that I'm sorry and quote 1 John 1, 9, if I'll confess my sin, he's faithful and just forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness, that's not forgiveness because that's not repentance. To repent means to turn from it. To ask God to forgive you and to still walk after it is not forgiveness. It's not repentance, it's remorse. You feel bad about it. And your conscience is troubled about it. So if you feel like you say the words, uh, then God will forgive and then you'll get peace and you'll get contentment. Uh, but the problem is without turning from it, the contentment never comes because there's no forgiveness. We find forgiveness in this wonderful chapter. We also find freedom in this wonderful chapter. Look in verse number 2. The Bible says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. I'm glad if the Son has set you free. You're free indeed. Hey, I used to be under bondage. Huh? I was under bondage to sin. And, uh, and I was under bondage to the law. Huh? And both of them was weighing against me. Huh? I was going down. Huh? Had no hope. Huh? Hey, I was under bondage and troubled. Huh? Uh, sin controlled me. Huh? Uh, the law condemned me. Huh? But thanks be unto God. Huh? One day Jesus stepped up. Huh? Hey, he took my sin on Calvary. Huh? He broke the chains of the law and fulfilled them. Huh? Hey, hallelujah, that night I got saved. He set me free. Hallelujah. Free indeed because of what he done in my life. I'm glad I'm not in bondage and I'm not entangled in bondage. But many Christians are tonight because they become entangled again with the yoke of bondage by walking after the flesh. Can I say, why after tasting freedom would you want, want to be a slave to sin again? But many do. And it affects their relationship. Hmm? Jesus forgives us and sets us free for a very important reason. So that we'll live unto Him. That others can see the victory they can have in Him. Others can see what a difference He'll make in them. No wonder He said we're the salt of the earth. No wonder He said we're the light of the world. No wonder He told us uh, that wonderful uh, uh, example uh, uh, that a city set on a hill cannot be hidden and that we shouldn't, uh, uh, no man take it a candle and light it and put it under a bushel. Uh, but hey, it give it light unto all the house. Uh, we're my dear friends to let our light so shine. Why? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God, help us to realize being free, my dear friend, is not free. It costs Christ everything. And there is a great cost and consequence that comes with it. And the great responsibility is that we must carry on that freedom. You know what's wrong with our country tonight? We've taken advantage of freedom. And day by day, week by week, month by month, Year by year, our freedoms are being taken away. Right now, our Congress is hard at work taking freedoms away right now, and most people don't even care. Because most people are so apathetic towards what's going on in Washington, you're like me, you tune it out. I could care less anymore. I'm so sick of it. And by apathy, they're just eroding our freedoms. Mm -mm. 
The Patriot Act. It's been in existence for a decade now. Stole a lot of our freedoms. And ever since then, more and more are being taken away. You say, Preacher, are you saying Republicans or Democrats? All of it. Huh? Right. When you got men destitute of truth and full of corrupt minds, seeking their own welfare and their own glory, not seeking what's best for others. My dear friends, freedom loses every day. And what's wrong in our churches is there's apathy. Why we have freedom in this land? We should walk in the freedom of Christ that others might see Him in us. So we see forgiveness. We see freedom. But I want you to notice our fight. I don't know about you. My biggest problem is not Washington. My biggest problem is not the church up the road or down the street. My biggest problem is not the guy who rents out the convention center in Houston, Texas. If you don't know who he is, he's got a million dollar smile and his name's Joel. Oh, my biggest problem. My biggest fight really is not even the devil. Matter of fact, I would to God I'd get so much God on me I'd get his attention. My biggest fight, and most like your biggest fight, is within your two ears. Hmm? Look at our fight. Look at verse number five. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. You know why there's so many churches are dead? They're carnal. Mm-hmm. Spiritually minded is life and peace. You know why there's so many churches that aren't lively? They're carnal. They're not spiritual. They have a set ritual. They call a service. The Spirit of God's never allowed to move. The Savior's standing outside the door knocking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open on me, I'll come in and sup with him. They don't want him to show up. Service might last past seven on Sunday night. Might last past noon on Sunday morning. They're not interested in the Lord showing up. They're interested in the Lord moving on their timetable. They're carnally minded. They've read every book on how to grow the church. And none of it's worked, so now they're buying into what the crazematics are doing. They're getting them rock bands, and they're getting drop-down screens with little courses on them that are catchy, and everybody will sing them, and everybody feels good about themselves, and, and it's all out of flesh. Dead in a hammer. They've sold the songbooks, they've changed the Bible, and their congregations keep dwindling and they can't get it. The problem isn't all the methods and everything they're going through, the problem is their heart. They're carnal, they're not spiritual. Let's read on. Here's the fight. Hmm? Verse 7. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's the problem with relationships. Folks that are lost don't realize they can't please God. They'll say, well, I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. God didn't hear your prayer. He's not interested in you winning the lottery. You can't please God in your flesh. The carnal mind's an enmity against God. And getting them to understand that is very difficult. How do you get them to understand it, preacher? You show them something different in your life than what they have. Hmm? He goes on to say this. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, 
to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye live through the spirit, uh, but if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Uh, my dear friends, there's our fight. The two natures, the flesh and the spirit. The one you feed the most is going to be the strongest. And that's our fight. Which one are we going to allow to win over? Are we going to yield ourselves to the Lord and to the spiritual things? The reason the holiness message this morning did not help people. The reason many chose not to come back tonight is they're walking after the flesh. They're not spiritual. Those that were here for devotion, we started out about those that God saved, it's God's will for them to become spiritual. If they're spiritual, they'll become fruitful. And if they're fruitful, they'll become uh, uh, joyful. And if they're joyful, they'll become thankful. It's very clear there in, in, in the uh, uh, first chapter of Colossians. But yet so many people don't want that. They want their 10-minute pick-me-up, run in and get their Starbucks version of religion, get them a double shot latte, whatever that junk is, and run out. You probably tell me. You, you hang out there. Huh? Huh? If I pulled in there, I wouldn't know. You know what I'd order if I pulled into Starbucks? Hot chocolate. And I have no idea what any of that other junk is. Did you ever see that Duck Dynasty one where they go into the coffee shop and this guy's ordering stuff and Chase looks at him and says, do you sell coffee? Huh? Huh? But listen, that's what people want from religion. They want something that comes in and perks them up and spikes them up. Gets them through another miserable week, through the miserable job, and their miserable life, and their miserable problems. Uh, and it's filtered into our Baptist churches. Uh, we think God is all about picking us up. Uh, hey, if you've ever uh, really saw yourself lost uh, and cried out to God, He did reach down into the pit uh, and pick you up, put you on a solid rock. Uh, hey, we ought to not come in to get picked up. Uh, we ought to come in and bless His holy name and lift Him up because how good He's been. Uh, the real fight is not getting a pick me up from God. The real fight is getting alone with God and learning to become spiritual. Feeding our spiritual man from the Word of God. Sad truth is, Miss Gail, some people only eat when they come to church. Yeah. Some people only pray when it's church time. And some don't even pray when it's church time. When it's time to pray, they just bow their heads and they're fiddling in their purse or messing around with their keys in their pocket. They aren't even praying then. And you wonder why your life's anemic and why you're still in bondage. Because you're losing the fight. Paul said, let a man examine himself whether he be in the faith. Hmm? If you're walking in the flesh all the time and have no spiritual desires, you better check up. You might not have the spirit. Hmm? Now notice, if you would, where we read our text, the family. Thanks be unto God for the family of God. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, verse 14, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. Hmm. I'm glad to know that I'm saved. I don't hope to be saved. I don't worry about being saved. I don't have to question about being saved. I know I'm saved. Why? Because of Romans 8, 14. For they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hmm? Hallelujah. Huh? Amen, Didn't call me a servant of God. Called me the son of God. Hmm? Huh? Hallelujah. Hmm? Then it goes on to say this, verse 15. For you not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Let me read that again. I think some independent Baptist preachers need to read this. For ye've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Can I say there are some Baptist preachers that try to intimidate their people and manipulate their people, and they keep their people afraid. I want to tell you something. That's not the Spirit of God. 
The Spirit of God is love and peace and of a sound mind. Huh? God don't give us a spirit of fear. Huh? Gives us joy. Unspeakable. Full of glory. I know there are people go to certain churches, they're afraid to breathe. And they're afraid a preacher might come around and look in their garbage can, see what they find in the garbage can. Hmm? That's a bunch of junk. I don't even look in my own garbage can. Let alone come looking in yours. You probably got leftover dead possum from him and yours. I ain't opening that thing. Huh? We don't have the spirit of fear. I'm not under bondage. I've been set free. I'm not fearful that God's going to strike me down dead if I step one step out of line. I don't want to step out of line. I got a spirit of joy. I got a spirit of anticipation. A spirit of excitement that even today the trumpet might sound and I'll be with him. Uh, what a blessing to have that spirit. Uh, but we find that, whoa, we receive the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Can I say tonight, there's nothing like being in the family of God. He sang that song about being an orphan but not being an orphan no more. Huh? I'm glad I'm no longer an orphan, Brother Phil. Amen. I have a heavenly father. Yes. Uh, Amen. Listen, there's three ways you can get a family. You're born into a family, you're adopted into a family, and you're married into a family. Can I say Jesus said, no man will enter into the kingdom of heaven and accept you be born again. Right. Uh, so you've got to be born into the family of God. Huh? We're born naturally into this world, but you must be born again, he told Nicodemus, huh? to get into the family of God. Huh? Hey, hallelujah, one of these days, the Bible said, Revelation 19, right, blessed are they yeah, that are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Huh? One of these days, the bride of Christ is going to be uh, espoused uh, and united in marriage to the Lamb uh, and forever will be uh, uh, united with Him in marriage. We'll be married to Him forevermore. Uh, but hallelujah, uh, I'm glad uh, we were received uh, the spirit of adoption. Uh, I'm glad that night I got born again on the third Saturday night of March in 1974. Uh, he not only birthed me into the family of God, uh, he adopted me in the family of God. Uh, he sealed me with the spirit of promise. Uh, hallelujah. He made me a child of his. Uh, now you got to understand under Jewish law, adoption was very significant. There was a lot in adoption. You just didn't say, I want to take this young at home and raise it as my own. There was a lot that went into it. You had to be a, a kinsman redeemer. There's all kinds of uh, 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 statutes and problems that had to be addressed and overcome. And once it was uh, 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 sanctified through the uh, uh, court, through the high priest, that you was eligible to adopt a child. And that adoption became final. Brother Clint, you had to write the adopted child in the will. Now you could get upset at your firstborn because under Jewish law, all inheritance went to the firstborn. But not when you adopted a child. When you adopted a child, the adopted child becomes co-heir and he gets half. He gets the equal share with the firstborn. And you could get upset at your firstborn. And you could write your firstborn out of your will under Jewish law. But you could never write the adopted child out of the will. I've got good news. Huh? Jesus, huh? the only begotten Son of the Father, huh? Huh? suspended between heaven and earth on the cross of Calvary, huh? cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Huh? God uh, uh, turned his back on him when he became your sin and my sin, huh? and God forsook his only begotten Son. Huh? But Jesus looked at you and I, huh? who've been adopted into the family of God. Huh? He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Hey, hey, God turned his back on his only begotten, but he'll never turn his back on us. We're in the family of God. Men made joint heirs to the throne of Christ, and nothing will ever change that. Oh, we ought to bless his holy name. Oh, he forgave us. 
made us free, gave us the spirit to help us in the fight, but then he's adopted us into his family tonight. Oh, we are not in, we are in this world, but not of this world. We're citizens of that land. Uh, no, we can cry, Abba, Father. Do you understand? That's why the Jews wanted to crucify him. Brother Clint, the Jews hated him. Not because of the miracles. Not because how wise he was. But because he called God Father. The Jews were never allowed to call him Father. They called him Jehovah. Jesus shows up and calls him Father. And that made Jesus equal with God. And they, they got upset. That's why they crucified him. But oh, even though he bore our shame and our pain, he adopted us and we get to call him Father. Hey, what a blessing to be adopted into the family of God. And we can crawl up in the lap of Almighty God and cry, Father. And he says, yes, my child. Uh, oh, what a blessing to be saved tonight. Uh, he who is holy is our holy heavenly Father. And we've been robed in his righteousness, washed in his blood, adopted into his family, never to be discarded out of the family of God. Uh, oh, thank the Lord for that. Uh, and then notice our finish, if you will. Look at verse 17. Well, look at verse 16. It's very good too. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Well, I like verse 16. Let me just say, I've thrown off on independent Baptists a little bit tonight. Let me throw off a little bit more. They don't like that verse. They don't like that spirit bearing witness stuff. Most independent Baptist preachers have been to college and we all got our degrees and we're all told the power's in the Word of God and the Word of God has to be expounded upon line upon line and precept upon precept uh, and we stand upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and the apostles uh, and you can date our church all the way back to Jesus Christ uh, and the perpetuity of the church and all the fundamentals and all the doctrines and all those wonderful things. There's a couple things they don't teach them in Bible college. First of all, this ain't yours. There. Don't ever give it to me again. First of all, they don't teach men how to pray in Bible college. Although they have some prayer sessions, but they don't teach them how to get in a prayer closet and pray. Grab a hold of the horns of the altar and wait till God shows up because that don't fit in their class schedule. They don't have a whole semester. This semester is going to be prayer. They don't do that. The second thing, they don't teach them anything about the Holy Ghost. Matter of fact, they don't even call him the Holy Ghost in independent Baptist colleges because that lines them up with Church of God's. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, when He speaks, I dare say you go, you go five miles north and you'll not hear an independent Baptist preacher call Him the Holy Ghost. They won't do it. Even though the Bible calls Him the Holy Ghost. Because they don't want to be charismatic. And uh, they're not, you know, and they're, they, they teach the Holy Spirit and they teach Him He's the silent partner. And he does things in the shadows and you never ever know that he's ever around. He never brings glory to himself and he doesn't. He always testifies of Christ. And he always points everything of, to Christ. And he always illuminates the scriptures and brings them unto our remembrance and he has an office work. But he is a person. And verse 16 is in the Bible. And he bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. He'll come by and he'll say, have a little goosebumps on me mm -hmm. to just let you know, boy, it's good to be saved. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Because independent Baptists will tell you, you're not saved by your feelings. You're not saved with emotion. You can't have any emotion because to be a good independent Baptist, you're not allowed to smile because your face will crack <laughs> and you're not allowed to raise your hand and you're not allowed to say amen and you've got to sit there like you're constipated. <laughs> huh? That's most independent Baptist churches. Huh? They need to get up there about being carnal. But I want to tell you something. When the Spirit of God lights in on your soul, 
and let you know you're one of His. And you start getting them goosebumps. You're liable to say amen. You're liable to shed a tear. You're liable to wave a hanky every now and then and hey, heaven help you. You might even run a lap every now and then if you really get a hold of what you are in Christ. The Spirit of God will bear witness with our spirit. And I'll tell you something else the Spirit of God does. I don't understand this. That's the best way I can explain this. There's something called a kindred spirit. A kindred spirit best defined this, Brother Stephen. Since I picked on you Starbucks, I'll, I'll come over and talk to you. Be nice to you. Huh? Have you ever met somebody for the first time that's like you've known them all your life? That's a kindred spirit. I have met Christian people for the first time. It's just like I've been going to church with them all my life. Just a kindred spirit. I've also met Christian people. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm not saying they're not born again. I'm not saying they don't believe the Bible, right? I'm not saying, but they're weird. My spirit don't line up with them. They show up and I get the heebie-jeebies. You know? Uh, you, you shake hands with them and you don't want to go to the washroom and wash. There's just something about them. I don't know about them. I just don't know. Don't know anything about them. But, but there's just some. You know, I, I, I've met some. The first time you meet them, you're just like, wow, man, that, that, that fellow, that lady, they're blessing. And I just like being around them. That's the Spirit of God does that. And He knits your hearts together. And He just does things like that. He does things in... That's him bearing witness. That's him doing things. He just does things like that. He always does things within the pages of the Word of God. He'll never do anything outside the pages of the Word of God. He always does everything based on Scripture. But he'll bear witness. And he'll just let somebody know, that's your kind right there. Hang out with that person, it'll be all right. Huh? But then notice the finish. Look at verse 17. And if children, hallelujah, children, that's me, then heirs, hallelujah, there's more to it. I mean, it's good enough just being part of the family of God, isn't it? Oh, no, there's more. Heirs, huh? Heirs of God. Hey, every now and then, you ever heard this statement? Boy, when my rich uncle gets out of the poorhouse. Anybody ever heard that statement? No, thank you, Miss Billy. I knew I had a country person in here. You pious crowd. Oh, I never heard that, huh? How about a Virginia contingent? You ever heard that? Yeah, okay, he's heard that. All right. My rich uncle gets out of the poorhouse, huh? That'd be a bl blessing if you had a rich uncle, but most people I know don't have a rich uncle. Huh? And if he is rich, he ain't telling you because he knows you'll be waiting in line, you know, when he kicks out. You might even help him along. No. Can you think? Being an heir to God. The one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the taters and all the gold and everything else in the hills? Yeah, huh? Amen. Huh? The Spirit, uh, verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Yeah. Yeah, that means everything Christ has, we're co-equal with. Yeah. We have everything He has, huh? Uh, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. Now listen, said all I'd say this. I know there's problems. I know there's heartaches. I know some of you are looked down upon because of your faith. I know some of you are broken hearted because you have children or loved ones not in church. I know some of you have sickness. I know some of you have financial problems. I know some of you have all kinds of other pressures and problems. And it seems like your lot in life is to carry that burden. But listen to me, honey. The sufferings of this present time won't even be a memory. When he reveals his glory and he says, half of it's yours. Huh? 
when his glory is revealed in you, you wish you'd have suffered more. You wish you'd have bore a bigger burden. You'd wish you'd have done more. When you see not only what he's done for you in salvation, no, but what he's went to prepare for you and what he's done all along the way in the shadows that you really haven't understood. Uh, friend, there's coming a day uh, you're really going to get beside yourself and come unglued when you see what he has in store for you. Uh, the finish is going to even be far better than the start when you see what he's got for you. Friend, I know you're in a fight. And I say nothing worth having is really free. The good thing about this fight we're in, we win. It's already been settled. It's just playing out. And I know there's hard days. I know there's hard times, beloved. That's all right. Brighter days ahead. Amen. You belong to the Lord. You're His youngin. He knows how to take care of you. He'll take care of it. He'll take care of it today. And I guarantee you He's got tomorrow taken care of. So just keep trusting. Keep believing. Keep looking to Him. And let Him... Be God in your life. If any sin, get it forgiven. If it's forgiven, He doesn't hold it against you. There's no condemnation. So quit beating yourself up. That's part of your fight. You've got a real problem. You won't forgive yourself. If you're free, you're free indeed. Walk in the freedom of the beauty of God. Huh? And just keep feeding the spiritual man, not the fleshly man. And then just rejoice in that you're in the family of God. And keep your eyes on the future because the finish is wonderful. Hmm? I know you don't believe this, but I used to run. I ran cross country one year. I only ran one year because that was enough. I let a stinking, sorry, no good friend of mine say, why don't you run cross country with me? I never did anything that didn't involve a ball. <laughs> okay. There's something about a mile and a half into a run up hills and down hills and through creeks and all this stuff that you get a pain somewhere up underneath your rib cage that you swear that part of you is coming out. <laughs> now, if you've never ran any distance, you have no idea what I'm talking about. If you've ran distance, you don't ever want that pain again. That pain hits, and wonderful coaches, coaches tell you, pinch your upper lip, the pain will go away. It don't go away, and then you look stupid. you just keep running and then you hit this thing called a runner's wall and you're moving but it feels like you're not moving it feels like one of them wind up cars that hits a wall and the tires are going but it's not going anywhere and that's what you feel like but if you can break through the pain and you can break through that runner's wall you can get to a point where they say you get a second wind. And you can come around and you can see the finish line. And you can find a boost that just a little bit earlier you thought you never would have. And you're able to finish. And you're able to finish strong. Now listen, friend. You might be in pain tonight. Keep running. You may have hit a wall. Keep running. The Lord's about ready to send you a second breath. It won't be long. We're going to get a glimpse of the finish line. Maybe you can see it tonight. Just keep running. Keep running. Because the prize is worth finishing strong. Amen. Don't get bumped out of the race tonight. 
It's not worth it. Too much at stake. Too many in the stands cheering you on. That great cloud of witnesses that's done gone on. Too many wondering if you got what it takes. Wondering if it's real. Watching you run. Just keep running. Keep running. Finish strong. So preacher, it's hard, but you're in the family of God. Your father owns it all. Huh? He'll help you through it. Just keep trusting. Keep running. Finish strong. And no telling how many you'll inspire to finish with you. Let's all stand.